on our panel right now, uh, Professor May Elwin from the Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. Welcome, Dr. May. And we also, uh, Dr. Adnan Hussein uh, from University Science Malaysia. And coming will be uh, Dr. Dandang Rahmat Hidayah, uh, Dean of Universitas Pajajaran. I, I think we know uh, one another, or at least we have heard one another. Uh, but the topic today is a very interesting topic. Um, we call it uh, communication education in this uncertain time. Eh? And I think we are always uncertain now with uh, the pandemic and economic crisis and whatnot. Eh? And I'm very happy uh, to learn from Ang Peng Hua that uh, Professor May, you have been uh, opted by the Singapore government. Uh, to give advice on uh, COVID. So I think if we can start the ball rolling, I can ask you, what is or what will you think the effect of COVID-19 on communication education or in Singapore or even in Asia or the rest of the world? Dr. May, if we may start the ball rolling. Yeah. Um, so, Professor Dato Idin and the uh, organizers, um, thank you very much for having me uh, for this panel. I'm very happy to be able to join you this morning and share a little bit about our experiences in Singapore. Uh, we came with School of Communication, where I'm from, within the Nanyang Technological University. Um, as well as to, you know, hear about your experiences as well, because this has been something that's uh, highly, highly unprecedented, right, in all our lifetimes. Um, the interesting thing about this whole experience has been that uh, I myself have been a health communication scholar, and for about 10 years, I have been doing work on um, uh, what, what you would call the uh, crisis preparedness, so crisis communication, health communication for infectious diseases and so on. So I have, uh, you know, come to KL and so on where, I, uh, where we have talked to um, scholars about uh, diseases like dengue and other types of um, uh, infectious diseases, things like influenza. And then of course, previously we had the SARS experience and then H1N1 and so on. So much of the, um, you know, experiences in the university, at least in uh, Singapore, has been the, the readiness models have been built around what we experienced during SARS. So if you think about lockdown and safe distancing and so on, those were, um, you know, from, from the learning experiences that we had in 2003, uh, where the university had certain uh, requirements. So, so you know, when the uh, COVID-19 hit, uh, many of those were rolled out. So, for example, we have um, the students and staff having to take temperature and so on. So there, there were all these, um, you know, physical requirements. I think that many of the countries underwent, right? So you've got um, the move, you know, in Singapore, all the classes move online in March. So both the primary and secondary schools and the university and, you know, the, the um, Wikimui school was no exception. So all the faculty had to move the, the classes online and there was a lot of, uh, of course, uh, challenges just like, you know, many of you, I'm sure we face issues about how to bring everything online suddenly and so on. In the, um, over the, the months the, of uh, June, July and August, it was really, looking at the learning experiences from March and April, and then trying to get things ready for the new semester, which we just started. You know, so in fact, I was just sharing that it was quite interesting because we, in, in the major universities in Singapore, based on our own experiences in March and April, we have mounted different types of models. So, we have uh, National University of Singapore, NUS, which is doing something called zoning. That means if you, the university is literally cut up into different zones and you cannot go into 
to another zone if you're in one zone, for instance. Then you've got the universities like Singapore Management University, which are doing odd and even days to control the crowd numbers. So if you are, uh, you know, if your, your number, um, student number ends with a certain number, you can't go in on, on particular days. Um, NTU has basically taken the approach that all the large classes are online and the small classes are um, in person. So that's under 50. So we are we are doing both. We have physical classes and we have um, online classes at the same time. And and I'm sure both in, in Indonesia mm -hmm. and Malaysia, you've you know faced um, similar types of of um, adjustments that had to make to be made in our physical and campus space. But I think that for me, the components that were most challenging were on the uh, on the front of pedagogy and education. So if I may just share very quickly, I don't know whether I'm allowed to, um, to, to share screen, but if I have yeah. a chance yeah. to, just, just to show you very quickly, um, the, you know, along this, can you see my, my slides down here? Just, uh, can you see this one yeah. about the curriculum review? Yes, so yes, we, we can see that. Yeah. Um, you know, um, my, my late mother was also an academic. She was, she taught mathematics. And I always envied her because um, she was in a, a field, and maybe the mathematicians won't agree with me, but she didn't really have to make many changes to her, you know, what she taught every year. She, you know, she taught the engineers, the basic uh, engineering mathematics, and every year is quite similar. But in, in the field of communication and uh, education, we find that we are having to adjust all the time, right? Because, yeah. you know, new technology happens and then new demands come in. And what's happening now, I believe, is uh, our, you know, major changes in the, um, in the entire world of communication and the media that we have to now think about how we're going to prepare the students for. So for instance, um, we just started this, which is looking at the curriculum and reviewing, you know, what we used to teach the students like basic media writing uh, foundation of communication studies, which teach them all the you know theories that that you learn in um, in the textbooks, right? Um, and media law and ethics, Professor Ang Ping Wan's uh, pet area. Um, we are having to to relook at the the core. So this is the core, not not the the professional track. So we our students, I think some of the universities might be similar in Malaysia and Indonesia too. They take the core, which is everybody has to take, and then they can specialize in different areas. So we have areas like public relations, advertising, journalism, and so on, right? So, but the core component, now we are wondering for the citizens of the future, you know, is this enough? Is this, um, is this how we want to prepare them for uh, uncertain? And I think they even have a term for it now, quite, they call it VUCA, which is volatile, uncertain, um, chaotic and ambiguous world, you know, do we have to teach them other skills like how to be adaptable, you know, digital literacy, for instance. So, so that whole um, conversation, um, I'll just stop sharing that, is, is, uh, is going on. Uh, and especially for communication, uh, education, it's uh, very demanding because not only do we have to look at the core, but the tracks that I showed you, what is happening in each of the areas, right? In, in um, uh, for example, in the space of advertising, uh, how much is moving towards a digital space? And, you know, what does that mean in terms of our curriculum, our internships and our uh, final year projects and, and, you know, things like that. So we are talking to the industry, but, you know, of course, everything is made more difficult by the current COVID situation. Even the industry is not sure exactly how they're going to move. But these challenges, I think, are particularly unique to communication. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's, that, that's just what I wanted to share for, um, to answer your question. Yeah. I just want to ask you one small question before we go to uh, Dr. Adnan. Yes. How different is this COVID has a form of crisis health management compared to the other uh, diseases like SARS or Ebola you have in Africa. How different is it when you tackle this from the health crisis point of view? Uh, 
Yeah, um, you know, uh, okay, so, so now veering a little bit into, yeah. into my area of research, um, I had, you know, in, in uh, kind of post-SARS and also uh, H1N1 and so on, I had been tracking the conversations on the social media space and the interface between uh, what you see on the media and the conversations that people have. Okay. So, okay, so of course, you, I mean, you know, on the scientific front and, and on economic front and all that, there's all sorts of differences between uh, COVID situation, which has you know, impacted the whole world and it's lasted so long. And um, the, the, the previous, some of the previous diseases in the past two de decades, right? But Interestingly, for the, from the communication perspective, one of the key findings that I had was that during H1N1, almost all the conversations that people were having, or that means what you repost, what you post, and so on, were related to what you see on the media or the government. So if the government says that, you know, this disease is, um, is going to have this type of impact, then you see people retweeting or resharing that information and quite closely aligning the conversations. But in this particular pandemic, since March, we find a whole wave of effect that's happening across the world, which the WHO has called an infodemic yeah, you know it's it's unprecedented. Like the the amount of of information that's coming out of individuals as well, and there's no relation no relation between the government, what the government and the health authorities share. Some information is being shared, but a lot of information is coming out from individuals and uh, citizens and other groups. So in that sense, it is. It's it's been quite difficult for, especially in some countries, you see this for the government to be able to make sure that they own the communication space because that's become contentious. There's a lot of debates, there's misinformation and other types of issues going on. So it's very interesting for communication scholars to look at the role of communication, you know, during this particular uh, COVID uh, time. So if anybody's interested in looking at uh, Malaysia information, you know, I've, I've been tracking since January, um, the, all the social media conversation on, on places like Facebook, Twitter, and so on. I'll be happy to do some collaboration on that. Yeah, but it's, okay, it's really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor May. Uh, can uh, uh, Bapak Ladang just, just came in. Uh, Selamat datang, Bapak. Selamat datang. Thank okay. you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Right, so, uh, okay. So, Bapak Anand, <laughs> can, can you give your comments on the possible effects of uh, COVID-19 on communication education? Can you hear me now? Sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you to IIUM for having me uh, for the invitations and uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be in this webinar. Uh, it looks like the uh, webinar is going to be the new norms. Uh, yeah. I think we have been meeting in a series of uh, webinar nowadays, uh, no longer face-to-face uh, -face, uh, seminar. Anyhow, I think what is important is the uh, message that we want to share uh, with everyone. Um, actually, the, the questions that was raised by uh, Prof. Uh, Dato Sai, uh, actually it's, it's supposed to be last uh, in my, my presentation. But anyway, uh, let, let, me, let me, so that I do not lose uh, what I want to say. Yeah, please. Um, yeah. I, I just want to touch first on this, what we call uh, the age of great uncertainties. Okay, uh, I think the themes of our panel discussion today is about uncertainties. And... Uh, just to, to give an overview about uh, the so-called the uncertainties. Uh, um, living in uncertainties is nothing new. I think Prof May also mentioned earlier on uh, that, uh, uh, that we, we have been facing uh, numerous uncertainties throughout our uh, human uh, history. Okay? And human civilizations experience and evolve around uncertainties, uh, uncertainties many times. Okay? be it economic, uh, political, social, health, so on and so forth. So I think, first of all, we have to accept the fact that uh, it's not new when we talk about uncertainties. We, we always live in the world of uncertainties. But what is 
what is different between the previous uncertainties and the current uncertainties is this, okay? uh, just to get the, the, the overall picture, that uh, we are facing two phenomena at the same time. Okay? First, we cannot forget, now we sort of put aside the discussion about the age of disruptive technologies and the age of disruptive innovation. Okay? That was the earlier uh, phenomena that hit us Okay, and, and we were quite uncertain how to deal with that. Okay? And we were taking some time to trying to find some answers and uh, adapt to the new uh, technology and, and many things that came together with the uh, fourth industrial revolution. Okay? So that was the first one. But at the same time, and we have the COVID-19 uh, beginning in December and now uh, almost three quarter of the year to 2020. So we have two phenomena of a global scale that hit the human uh, societies all uh, the world over. Okay? So this is what I consider as the age of uh, great uncertainties because there are two global phenomena that hit, hit us. Okay? So we have the, the, the age of disruptive technologies coupled with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. That is the first thing that we have to remember. We cannot uh, ignore the fact that we are also dealing with these disruptive technologies that we are having now. Okay? Um, the second uh, aspect of the current uncertainties is the speed and the scale of the phenomena is unprecedented. Okay? And I think again, Prof May also mentioned about a lot of things are, are unprecedented these days, yeah? uh, which is the impact is bigger, faster uh, compared to the previous phenomena. So, it is sort of, uh, when we talk about the uncertainties that we are facing now, it is a double whammy, eh, where we were hit by two big uh, phenomena. And I think a lot of people uh, start talking about all these things. Okay, uh, what will this do to our communication education? Um, I think for many years already, we have been talking about the uncertainties under the four, in fourth industrial revolution. Eh? Uh, we are talking about uh, revising curriculum, and I think just like what happened in Singapore and NTU, I think Malaysian uh, education, uh, communication education are also doing the same thing, uh, revising a lot of things. Okay? But uh, previously, we are taking a lot of time. Okay? When we talk about revised uh, curriculum, uh, we are looking back into what needs to be done with the 4IR the speed of those uh, uh, review or revision of curriculum, uh, I think it's, it's rather, uh, rather slow, I would say. Eh? We are taking a lot of time. But with pandemic uh, or COVID-19 pandemic, now suddenly we feel uh, the urge, the, 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 the immediate need for us to change. Uh, we can no longer uh, play with time because we the time is not on our side and we have to do it uh, very fast. Uh, I think the concern of the uh, higher education, especially I think in Malaysia and elsewhere in the world, uh, first when it comes to uh, higher education is about uh, students' population, okay? uh, especially the international students' uh, population uh, in many universities. Uh, doing down now uh, because of uh, we cannot travel. Eh? Uh, the impact on the teaching and learning, eh? I think this is very obvious uh, since uh, many months now we have to change, we have to migrate to online or virtual le learning or some kind of hybrid both, a eh? face-to-face plus the, the online. And of course, uh, new research areas coming up eh? and uh, there are so many uh, uh, issues that are related to research, but of course the most important is about the funding, okay. the research activities itself, how do we conduct research under COVID-19. Okay. And I think one area uh, that we all are concerned about is about the mobility of students and staff. Okay. Uh, even though now when we talk about uh, mobility among staff, when we want to, to, to do uh, international seminar, conferences, we can still do it uh, webinar uh, way. But I think for the students, eh, uh, just meeting online with their counterparts in other countries may not be sufficient. 
Okay? So this limits the movement of the students from one country to another country, which before the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we were able to freely travel the world uh, over and, and the students can gain a lot of experience. So uh, these are some of the areas of concern uh, that uh, we, we are facing right now, uh, Prof. Sai and, and the rest of the uh, members. Eh? So I'm, I'm outlining some of the issues that we are facing and uh, later we, I can discuss about uh, what steps uh, needs to be done. But I think uh, uh, a lot of things have been shared by Prof. May. Uh, I think that's wonderful to hear what Singapore is doing and I think uh, we would like to hear more about that, but I think at the same time, we are also doing uh, quite uh, a lot of things in, in uh, Malaysia. So with that for now, I leave a few questions for the uh, discussion uh, later on. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you see two, a, a common enemy, but two different <laughs> approaches uh, taken by Malaysia and taken by Singapore. We'd like to know from, from Indonesia. What is Indonesia's response to this common threat? Uh, Professor yeah. Dada? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. May I share the slide? Yes, please. Okay. <clears throat> okay, yeah. Okay? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Dato Sri, Professor Adnan, and Professor Kamei. Everybody, good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity. I hope uh, you will always be healthy. I will compare my education. <laughs> I will on communication education in condition of uh, uncertainty uh, due to, to COVID-19. Uh, uh, 19. Yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, from the data obtained, uh, it's appeared that in many ways, the uncertainty began with the uncertainty of when this pandemic will end. At least in some countries that have not yet found a turning point for a positive case. This is positive case, and uh, if we see that uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore is at the uh, April, I think the same uh, number. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, <laughs> but now. <laughs> Now, Indonesia is the champion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I think, yeah, this is uh, very serious for for uh, our country uh, for the COVID-19. Uh, uh, I think some countries uh, can control it so well that it doesn't explode or increase significantly. So. Uh, COVID-19, in my uh, perspective, uh, initially seen as a health case, has developed into the dimensional, the multidimensional social, economic, political, and even humanitarian case or issue. In that case, I have the view that there is a communication aspect in it in order. There is a communication problem, yeah? Uh, commission problem for the uh, like the uh, this COVID, I think measure several social pillars in about the health system, government capability to handle it, uh, social resilience and individual uh, quality. Uh, so in Indonesia, in Indonesia from the beginning, there were communication problem identified. There are the uh, public figure said that uh, people, uh, what we said that, uh, don't need to wear masks or didn't not take the COVID-19 uh, issue seriously. This is the problem uh, communication. So that people behavior was not well formed in dealing with COVID-19. Uh, and then, uh, this is not mentioned the circulation affairs incorrect information, which become like an infodemic, uh, like the professor may say that. In the midst of the opportunity, an opportunity to get information, it should be a blessing. It should be a blessing. But uh, 
if the wrong way, uh, but if one goes wrong, it can be an information disaster. Our challenge to how to help this uh, condition, I think. Yeah, this is the challenge of communication role in assessment time. There are, there are social misunderstanding on pandemic phenomenon, infodemic disinformation, fake news, post truth, and the lack of ability of uh, communication uh, management. Yeah, uh, and then under certain condition, for example, political escalation and social tension will be increasingly if there is no solidarity at local, regional, and global levels. In case of COVID-19, it's impossible to allow a country to collapse unless isolation is carried out, I think. Yeah, uh, uncertainties in pandemic life uh, related to uncertainty of pandemic phenomenon itself, uncertainty of social life, uncertainty of economic, uncertainty of communication industry. So uh, like the communication professional work and uncertainty of communication education. Uh, example, they are, they are the resource, about the resources. And it's kind of like the sustainability. How about the sustainability of education uh, business uh, for some uh, campus in Indonesia is very serious, I think. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we should not known when it will end. It requires new method and approaches for the implementation of campus activities, like in my campus, and the sustainability of educational services, so that they remain productive and performing as well as maintaining the health of lectures and education staff and, uh, edu uh, and, student, and students, I think. Uh, communication education, how to deal with the pandemic, uh, like the, said the Professor Adnan, the curriculum should be adaptive, collaborative, collaborative between uh, in, in University uh, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and the other country. So curriculum should be creative. And maybe uh, it's time uh, change and change again, change the substance and delivery method. Yeah, changing education that is isolated by the classroom. Uh, the pandemic uh, forced us to deliver uh, with about the 90% uh, the class uh, doing with the uh, virtual, like a Zoom, uh, Google Meet, and something like that. Uh, so in the substances, I think in the short term, uh, how communication academic and communication expert become part of the pandemic problem solving in the context of the communication. Uh, in the long term, how the communication was to strengthen a role not only of contribute in the field of communication industry, but also in wide social issues like the uh, study of health communication, environmental communication, peace communication, and other uh, social issues. So uh, you know that before we can. Uh, watch the soccer or football be, uh, together and know so many uh, conditions, there are restriction, police uh, watching us and we're facing the, the new normal. And then, uh, you know that uh, WHO uh, mentioned, uh, estimate that COVID-19 will not necessarily uh, be controlled for the next few years. So that needs the collaboration uh, to be done optimally, I think. Uh, uh, this is, sorry, this is the, our figure, uh, how uh, we can, uh, and, uh, we, we have to, 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 we should the adaptation, collaboration, we need uh, alliance and action togetherness, discipline. So not only in campus, I think uh, the collaboration in my term in, uh, as I call it the pentaholic for uh, facing the COVID-19 uh, in media, business, uh, academy, community, government. In Indonesia, I think the, the main actor is community because uh, this is very hard for, our, for us to see the 
so many uh, community not allow about the mass or something, uh, some uh, mass or the uh, the others uh, behaviors. Uh, so I think we have the truly we have the social capital, uh, the like uh, trust, respect, and helpful not only in uh, local but I think in the uh, uh, regional or unit or, or regional. I think in in Asia or Southeast Asia. Uh, about the disruption of education model in time of uncertainty, uh, we have uh, considered about the value, price, product focus and curriculum uh, about the curriculum uh, the relaxation curriculum with a blended learning model approach online or face-to-face -face learning remain humanist humanist uh, creative and has a wide network of intellectual abilities with social uh, sensitivity and then uh, about the research i think this is an opportunity for us to make the uh, the research about the COVID, not only in our own university, but I think the collaboration research is very good uh, because COVID is not is borderless. Uh, the, uh, how about the uh, urgency uh, research and development activities must answer the need of the community both on the national and global scale and uh, finding our new knowledge that can be applied uh, to improve the quality of health and community life. Partnership, I think partnership between academic research, researchers with companies, industries, and investors are carried out by utilizing information technology and solution oriented to the COVID-19 pandemic problem. This pentahelic uh, partnership will synergize the resource on so as the, to reduce the required financial burden. I think goes to normal life, no turning back. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. So, so I hope um, our new normal is not based on the old normal. It should be <laughs> the new normal. If we are still based on the old normal, we will soon be back to the new track. Eh? <laughs> okay. so I hope something new comes up. Eh? So, okay, uh, we will come back to this um, uh, the concern on uh, COVID, but we will have to go on this uh, second uh, subtopic, which is the economic uh, factor. I presume at the present time, the COVID-19 has an effect or tremendous impact on the economic activity. But before this uh, COVID-19, uh, universities in Asia or Southeast Asia were also concerned with the economic problems. Huh? Economic problems. Uh, the oil prices were coming down, so it has a tremendous effect on on Malaysia and, and, and Indonesia, uh, and also in directly on, on Singapore. Eh? Now, my, big, my, my, my question, our second question is, what is the effect of the economic problems on universities in your respective country? So if I can go to uh, Dr. Annan Hussein. Hey, uh, thank you, uh, from Dr. Usai. Uh, I think the, the biggest impact of uh, pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic is about uh, the funding for higher education. Uh, if you look at the trend uh, in the case of uh, Malaysia, okay, the funding uh, for the past four or five years has been on a steady increase, okay, especially for the higher education. Uh, in 2017, for instance, uh, Ministry of Higher Education uh, received 12.28 uh, uh, billion okay, uh, in terms of uh, annual budget given by the uh, government uh, to all the uh, 20 universities. And that was uh, uh, then in 2018, there was an increase uh, to 13.89 uh, billion okay, uh, for just for the higher education. Okay, and for uh, there was an increase of about 13.5 percent okay, uh, between 2017 and 2018. And in 2019, when the new government uh, combined okay, combined the uh, higher education and a ministry of higher education, the ministry of education as one ministry, uh, they, the the ministry received 60.2 billion. Okay, 
which accounts for about 19.1% uh, of the total national budget, okay, which is uh, the highest single uh, ministry that receive uh, uh, national, uh, what you call the budget, annual budget by allocated by the uh, government. Okay. And for the 2020, still under the same ministry before it was uh, divided or separated into two separate ministry again, uh, the Minister of Education uh, received 64.1 billion. Okay? So there was a steady increase in terms of the budget given by the government. But okay, the big question is how much is the budget that will be allocated for 2021 and so on. And this is where the great uncertainties uh, comes in. Okay? So assuming that we get almost the same then we might be doing the same thing for the, what we have been doing. But uh, if there is a, a decrease, okay, uh, there is an indication already given by the government that there will be a, a decrease in, in allocations to various ministries and including the uh, higher education ministries. Okay? And this is going to be a big problem to the universities. Just to share with you, uh, even though the national uh, allocation, the budget that was allocated to the uh, public universities for the past uh, many years has been on the increase, but if we look at some universities, some uh, matured universities, some senior universities, eh, uh, including uh, University of Science Malaysia, actually we are getting less. Okay? We are getting less and less from the government. We were asked uh, uh, to uh, cough out or to raise our own funding to pay for a lot of things, uh, including uh, part of our uh, enumerations. Okay? So this is a big responsibility for the university even before the COVID-19. Uh, okay? We are already facing some uh, steep problems, financial problems eh, that we have to deal and we have to be creative, we have to be innovative in raising uh, fundings and uh, trying to cope with the, uh, uh, all the problems of uh, shortage of funding. So uh, now with, with the pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we are not sure whether we will be getting the same amount or about the same amount or we are getting much less. So we have to wait for the next uh, budget uh, uh, presentation uh, sitting in uh, parliament sitting uh, in o October or November to know uh, where we are going from. But uh, currently, we are already facing a huge uh, problems. Um, and the problems, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, were based on two things. Uh, we, are, we are supposed to upgrade eh, a lot of things, our, a lot of our infrastructure, infrastructures in the universities uh, for the coming of the 4IR. Eh? Uh, we, we can no longer be teaching in the uh, old mode of a teaching. Eh? So we need to upgrade all, a lot of, of uh, we have to incorporate a lot of new technology and hence that needs a lot of uh, funding, huge funding. Eh? And that's not forthcoming now. Eh? So in other words, the university, if they need to deal with this new technology, the, the new needs, so on and so forth, we have to come up with uh, our own money. With uh, things is, is getting worse with, with uh, pandemic, uh, sorry, COVID-19 COVID pandemic uh, because uh, not only we have to move very fast, eh, uh, we have to change all the technology, but we also have to move very fast. Eh? Uh, if you look at now, if we have the infrastructure, eh, I always envy uh, Singapore University. Eh, we visited uh, uh, Nanyang University many years ago, Nanyang Technological. We visited uh, Singapore National University of Singapore about 10 years ago. I've seen they are already well prepared as far as the technology is concerned. They're very much ready for the 4IR already. Eh? They are part of the 4IR. Whereas we in Malaysia were still struggling. Eh? So with the pandemic uh, uh, looming on our head. So we, we have two problems uh, facing us that not only we are dealing with the, the issues of trying to upgrade, trying to get new technology for our uh, students and the teaching community, but uh, also uh, 
we have to deal with the new norms, eh? uh, online teaching uh, with uh, the new behavior. And this is a big uh, problem to universities uh, that, that we are facing. So I think uh, uh, if we talk about, again, uncertainties in terms of uh, funding eh? in, uh, or the issues, the impact of funding, uh, there is a great uncertainties again. Eh? Uh, we are hoping, we are hoping that uh, our government can find ways and means to maintain, if not to increase, the budget for the uh, higher education. Eh? And that's only one part of the story. When we talk about public education, of course, in, in Malaysia and many parts of the world, we have both public and private education. Eh? Uh, we, we are struggling, the government are struggling for the uh, public education, eh? trying to maintain uh, the universities with the uh, uh, what you call a, a decent budget okay, uh, for the universities. But what about the private universities? The private universities rely on the uh, students' fees, 100% okay? on students' fees. They are not getting any helps or funding from the government. Okay? The question is, can the students afford under the new uh, problems of pandemic where uh, issues of uh, unemployment, issues of... Uh, uh, losing jobs uh, by families. Uh, I think their concern is to make sure that they can have food on the table rather than, than to, to think about uh, education, higher education for their students. So that is, uh, I think uh, the uh, private universities uh, will be hard hit by this uh, uh, pandemic eh, uh, of losing uh, students. Uh, and, and as we all know that uh, uh, private institutions, either in Malaysia or many parts of the world, uh, rely a lot on international students. Okay, uh, for instance, uh, we have a, a, a lot of students from Indonesia. Okay, uh, in in USM, for instance, Indonesian students is the highest uh, international students population. Okay, so with pandemic uh, um, around. Uh, and now uh, we just received the information a few days ago that uh, uh, we are not allowing uh, travelers of uh, Indonesians to come to Malaysia uh, beginning on the 7th of September. So imagine eh, uh, if uh, we cannot get students uh, from uh, other parts of the world, eh, the international uh, community, or oh, sorry, the private universities will be losing a lot of uh, uh, students. So again, this will impact on the financial and then running of the, those uh, private universities. So in short, I think uh, if you look at the, uh, the current situation, uh, it is very critical eh, for both private and public universities to look at into their uh, financial situation. Uh, I'm not sure whether I can, I can say it here or not, but I think uh, as in, in the case of USM, for instance, University of Science Malaysia, we are facing huge uh, financial problems, uh, if not uh, a crisis. Eh? In fact, uh, uh, the university has set up two committees to look into uh, the situation and uh, uh, to ensure that the uh, university can function, uh, if not improve uh, in the next uh, few years. Okay? So I think uh, I will leave it uh, at that point uh, for now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Nan Hussein. As uh, Professor May, you, may you, you will agree with me that crisis breeds crisis. Eh? So pandemic will breed this economic crisis. What, what will be the impact or what is the impact now? Economic, uh, economic problems on the universities in Singapore. Professor May. Thank you. Uh, you, you know, uh, I think um, Professor uh, Adnan um, uh, really articulated all the issues uh, very well. You know, I, I can see all the parallel problems in terms of the headwinds that we have in terms of budgets and the uh, tightening of the economic situation, right? And I think similar to you, we are also waiting to see next year's budget, which is the 2021-22. And we are all kind of like, you know, holding our breath and expecting uh, certainly uh, strong cuts and it's going to have impact on uh, many different fronts, which you have, have mentioned uh, very well. Now, um, uh, what, you know, perhaps kind of predicting 
that this is inevitable and this is going to happen. Um, let me share with you a little bit about my experience um, as a Asia Scholar Professor. I have an adjunct position in University of Melbourne. So I've been communicating with the uh, faculty there and so on. And they are not waiting until 2021, 22. In fact, across Australia, many of the universities are already facing cuts immediately. So even as of now, they are seeing the um, either the freeze or the you know contractual obligations not being uh, renewed and other types of tightening, for example, like budgets that have not been uh, spent um, to um, to do not be there anymore, you know. So, for instance, yeah, you, you're supposed to have a certain budget to run the department. It's um, being shrunken because I think that some of the um, issues that we are all facing is probably even more severe for on the Australian front because I think they had this whole issue of all the foreign students not being able to come in, and it's possible that um, they, they've already, um, you know, got hit very badly on the, um, the, the university funding front. Um, and, you know, and, and so one of the um, uh, additional concerns that I, um, I, I'd like to raise, you know, on this panel as well is that is how we try to uh, ascertain the future of uh, communication education. Um, I'm not sure whether it's your experience, but in my experience, oftentimes communication is being sort of uh, taken together with uh, social sciences, humanities, and so on. So in a university, oftentimes when there is a, a, a hit or tightening of the budgets, the um, uh, you know, the effect is not similar across all the different faculties and so on. For instance, I think there is an agreement across the world that, uh, you know, people doing research in uh, COVID, for instance, and also the um, uh, medical faculty, right, that, that will continue to, to get um, a large amount of the funding. So some prioritization will be going on within the universities. And, you know, I, I personally think that we need to do more to educate the, um, you know, the, the upper level university managements about the value of uh, communication education and not to just kind of, you know, put us together with, uh, I mean, certainly we appreciate being with our humanities and social science um, colleagues and so on. But when, when I look at some of the numbers that are coming out on the economic front, I think there were some reports that showed, you know, uh, what are the types of jobs that are shrinking and what are the areas uh, where there's actually an expansion and communication related jobs there's actually an expansion if you if you consider the digital frontier and so on um, and and you know um, uh, some of these uh, areas which are going to as far as I understand at least in in Australia they're going to continue to receive um, strong funding like computer science uh, that needs to be understood or studied in the context of information technology how it pertains to people exactly what um, you know uh, uh, professor um, uh, Dadang uh, 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 Ramad has also uh, mentioned right about um, the the need to understand the wider um, you know, socioeconomic context that's driven by edu uh, the communication. Communication is driving so many of the human behaviors right now. So I, I guess, you know, that's, that's um, the, one of the takeaways and my worries um, looking at Australia's situation, which is that, you know, in fact, even within universities, some of the areas are getting uh, deeper cuts and, um, and more uh, demands uh, and, and our communication colleagues in Australia are really uh, feeling these cuts uh, a lot more than our, uh, for example, the, the science colleagues in those universities. So that's something that I think we all, you know, in the region can work together to help to educate our uh, university management. I know sometimes it's very difficult to, to try and explain and so on, but, you know, communication is going to play a big role in the post-COVID era if it's not already playing a big role now. And, and there will be demand you know, for for jobs and opportunities uh, for young people in this uh, very important space. So, so I, I just wanted to you know put that out as a, a call to action from from our uh, scholarly community as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Bay. Uh, can we hear the views from uh, Professor Dadang? Uh, 
uh, what is happening in Indonesia? Yeah, thank you. Uh, what was conveyed by Professor Adnan uh, and Professor May was not much different uh, from Indonesia. Of course, uh, COVID-19 has an impact on economic aspect and the ability of society uh, to pay uh, campus, yeah, uh, campus tuition, tuition fees. Uh, the government asked every campus, especially uh, public uh, campus, uh, to relax to, or adjust to the ability of the public to pay. Uh, some allocation are assisted by the state, but uh, or government, but are still for the implementation, uh, the learning process. Some physical or infrastructure development is delayed. Uh, this year, uh, our campus received about uh, Universitas Pajajaran received about uh, 3,000 students, of which more than 30% uh, ask for postpone, postponement, postponement, and uh, a reduction in tuition fees. <laughs> Uh, so I don't have any data about uh, private campuses uh, with this uncertain condition. Uh, part of uh, the loss or, or or loss of the students, I think uh, they 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 lost the the, the potential student. The government il uh, government itself uh, is struggling to cope with health problem and economic slowdowns. This means uh, that its campus must be smart hard enough to raise financing. Of course, our campus opportunities to get foreign students are also reduced, as may be the case in separate campuses in Malaysia, which accept quite a lot of students from abroad. Likewise, to send our uh, lectures and students to various countries or invite the professor to our campus, I think it's need an efficient but elegant way with cooperation between communication education campuses. Of course, we strengthen in resource opportunities by using their uh, respective resources. That's professor. Okay, is is a funding in uh, in Indonesia? I think it's quite different. In Singapore and Malaysia, it's coming from what is called the central government. But in Indonesia, it's coming from the central government and the provinces, is it? Are you getting also funding from the provinces? No, no. For the public uh, universities, uh, the funding uh, come from the central uh, government and also from the uh, community at, as a uh, tuition fees. The, uh, the province is not uh, 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 their uh, responsibility to the higher education. Uh, but the province, uh, the responsibility for the uh, uh, high school, uh, something like that, not for the higher education. The higher, uh, your, your central government is still responsible for funding uh, given to universities as, as a whole. Yeah, yeah okay, the same, I think, in, in uh, Singapore and, and in Malaysia. Uh, yeah. I, I, you know, if yeah. I can just add to that, yeah, not please. not only um, are we getting uh, probably you, you know the the budget um, challenges, but we will also be getting um, challenges on the headcount front. I think they call them headcount, both on the administrative and and uh, faculty uh, numbers, right? So so there will be you know restrictions that are being imposed on that front as well, which makes it very difficult. Yeah. Uh, yeah, across the, the university, you know, just to um, to justify every single um, yeah hire that we, we would yeah have to do yeah. Okay, can we come to the the third topic or subtopic you call it? Uh, we have a look at uh, COVID nineteen, look at economic problem, uh, but communication education is also affected by the changing media landscape. Yeah and how uh, responsive we are to this change in the media landscape affects the manner in which we devise our curricula yeah? and how we train our staff and at the same time how we change our students. Uh, in what way, uh, Professor uh, Dadang, 
the changing media landscape has affected uh, communica uh, communication education in, in Indonesia? Yeah, uh, of course, uh, the changing about the landscape of media uh, affected to our curriculum, but uh, we have to uh, uh, careful to change the change the curriculum uh, because not only disruption but uh, I think we need uh, to have the idealist uh, perspective yeah uh, not only uh, our campus not only support the the uh, media landscape or industrial but uh, I think so many uh, problems social problems as I, as I said that in this in, our, in my slide that so many uh, problem in the social uh, uh, life that's the problem of communication so so that's why uh, our curriculum uh, will be designed uh, changing the uh, changing uh, to the uh, between the industrial media uh, needs and uh, uh, the, the community needs uh, so that's why uh, not only curriculum we we built, we established the research, uh, the special research about the uh, environmental communication, about the health communication, about the peace uh, communication. Because in Indonesia, so many, <coughs> so many potential for the conflict. I think the curriculum uh, uh, should be built uh, for the whole of needs, not only because the media landscape uh, uh, changing, but uh, the uh, the change of the media landscape also uh, that is my uh, our uh, concern to uh, make adjustment about that. So me, if you can say something about the changing media landscape, I presume now you you're very Singapore is very very far in front eh, in terms of technological advancement. Yeah, uh, yeah, that also poses challenges on how we you know, approach our curriculum and the links to the uh, changing media landscape. Um, if I could just share this screen again, uh, yeah. if you could just look at this one. Can you kind of see, um, just yes. wanted to share with you, you know, that it's kind of like almost different challenges for our programs because we've got, um, these are the programs that the Wikim Wee School offers and you can see that um, the, uh, uh, the undergraduate programs, for instance, right? The blue ones are our bread and butter programs. That means that's where the majority of the students uh, go into. And, and I mentioned earlier the different areas of specialization like public relations and so on. So we have our CS and the CSBU with the business school. But, you know, of late, um, it, was, it was quite timely because just before COVID, we had launched the Bachelor of Arts with a double major, Economics and Media Analytics. So we, we started, um, uh, you know, a track on media analytics, looking at digital media, how you would um, utilize the, uh, the, the, the media uh, for both communication as well as um, business purposes. And so now that has become very timely because when we talk to the industry and we look at the, the skills of the future that's needed, there is a lot of emphasis that's being put on the, uh, the, the utilization of large data, uh, digital technology, and so on. Um, in the same way, in, under the graduate programs, uh, I think that some of my uh, Malaysian colleagues would know, uh, actually Professor Ang runs the Masters in uh, Media and Communication, our MMC program. That is our bread and butter and that's where we have the large proportion of students and that will, will remain um, relevant still, but some of our programs are smaller programs, you know, like Masters in Knowledge Management, uh, Information Systems and Information Studies. There's there's quite a lot of demand now on that space and we are relaunching, re, 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 um, uh, uh, restructuring these courses for the new economy, the new knowledge management economy. And, and uh, we're going to be relaunching these uh, with the view of the post-COVID world. So I think a lot of industry output uh, input uh, is going to be required on that front. Uh, I mean, the, the black ones, of course, are our research programs. But you can see that we've got to... Uh, to try to align both on the undergraduate front and the graduate front. And then what's happening on the graduate front is that not only do we have um, 
the, the, the knowledge and the content itself that needs to be, be aligned with industry, but also the issues of the adult learners. You know, so in the past, I think as you've mentioned, we have um, a lot of uh, overseas students who would come into Singapore, they would spend a year or two um, doing our master's programs and then going back to home country. But now that's, that's difficult. So the virtual um, but, you know, virtual courses, how they are hybrid courses, how we are going to structure them. And then what does this mean for the entire master's program? Are we going to, um, to keep it to, to two years, for instance, or are we going to break it up into, uh, into numerous elements so that if somebody wanted to come to Singapore, uh, you know, two months out of the year, uh, or if they wanted to do certain components virtually, we could stack them. So one of the movements that we've got here is, uh, is known as like a, a skills future where you could have a longer timeline to struct, to take your uh, courses while you are still working in your home countries, but maybe coming here once in a while or maybe um, uh, doing virtual learning. And then we even when you finish a certain number of courses, we, we call, we are going to mount something called mini masters. So you'll have like a certification and then you can continue to take over time so that you don't have to sacrifice that uh, two years, you know, because that might be a luxury now for, for any student to stop work and just kind of uh, fly to any country to, to, to come and do uh, master studies for two years. So, so the, the challenges on the master's front, uh, especially are, are in fact more numerous because it, it involves be a lot of our students um, for the undergraduate programs are from Singapore, but for the um, master's and PhD programs, they are from uh, many other parts of the world. So I think these are the issues we are facing as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Adnan, Adnan Hussein, what okay. is our okay. mission response to the changing right. media landscape? Okay, I think uh, the uh, media landscape has been constantly changing uh, several years, uh, for the past several years, uh, with the new uh, technology, not just because of the uh, pandemic. Eh? Uh, but the pandemic uh, now reinvent uh, the organization uh, because we need to work uh, work from home concept you know uh, we, we have to work uh, uh, at remote uh, remotely or at our own uh, home so on and so forth uh, there is a, a need for the speed okay, in, in terms of our communication so I think uh, what I foresee uh, among uh, importance uh, aspect in communication curriculum and communication education is to focus on communication in organization. I think uh, there will be a new uh, experts areas that people need, eh? uh, people with uh, expertise in, in uh, effective communication in an organization to help the organization to move on. Eh? So it's not just about uh, the media uh, industry and the media landscape that we are talking about. But I think the whole uh, industry or the whole organization in any nation for that matter would want or requires uh, experts in communication uh, education. So, uh, sorry, uh, uh, what do you call in communication organization. So, uh, some specific courses that uh, were left behind except for I think in Singapore, they have already had uh, strategic communication courses. I think in Malaysia, we have not seen strategic communication courses being uh, as, a, as one of those core courses uh, that, has been, that should be introduced. So I think uh, in our revision, we have to look into the possibilities of introducing uh, strategic communication courses because of the need of the industries uh, to reinvent their, their organization. Uh, a quick look, for instance, uh, we look at India, uh, MBBS, it, it is a, 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 what do you call, medical program, eh? but they have already started introducing what they call a pandemic management. Eh? So that's how fast people respond to uh, change. As I mentioned earlier, speed is very important. Eh? So we cannot think, keep on doing, keep on on thinking of doing things. Eh? We need to change, we need to change, but we, we are not doing it. But uh, uh, even MBBS programs in India, they have already introduced uh, pandemic management 
causes as a, one of those co 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 causes in MBBS. Okay, so I think the same thing goes for US. Uh, what we call the communication programs uh, curriculum that we need to uh, immediately uh, change. But I also would like to see uh, a bigger issues pertaining to uh, the needs uh, of the uh, changing uh, uh, media landscapes and uh, uh, curriculum. Yeah? Uh, I'm not sure if I can share this. Uh, uh, how do I do that? I, I want to share my slides on the changing skill sets. Um, let me see if I can uh, share. Share screen. The little Sorry. green button at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. But uh, it's not coming. I have a share screen, but uh, hmm. Push. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> Just uh, bear with me for a while. Okay. Um, can, can you see? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's it's okay. It's uh, in, in the meantime, while it's loading the uh, slides, uh, I just want to bring to the attention uh, to uh, attention to the. Uh, the skill sets we are talking about not specific skills pertaining to communication alone, but the for the current and the future graduates that we need to prepare. Um, okay, let me. It's kind of slow responding. Yeah, it's coming in there. Hope you can. Yeah. Yeah. You can bear with me for a while. I'm going to that particular slide. Uh, I'm sharing with you the uh, the so-called the new skill sets uh, that was identified by the World Economic Forum. Okay, back in 2015, okay, the top ten uh, skill sets needed for the graduates at that time. Okay. For those, uh, including communication students, are complex problem solving, coordinating with others, so on and so forth. But in 2000, uh, in 2020, the World Economic Forum has already revised the new skill sets. The top three uh, skill sets we can see: the top three is a complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, and the rest, so on and so forth. What I'm pointing out is that. Besides just thinking about some specific knowledge and skills about communication that we have to deal with the new, uh, with the pandemic and also with the, uh, what we call the uh, new technology, the changing media landscape. But I think we also have to uh, refocus our curriculum to ensure that our graduates that we produce will be able, will have all these skill sets, okay? uh, the complex problem solving. Okay? I think that's very crucial uh, uh, from now up to, uh, uh, this is the, the, the identified by World Economic Forums right through 2030, okay? Critical thinking, we mentioned about critical thinking, you know, uh, but what exactly is critical thinking? How do we incorporate critical thinking in our curriculum? Uh, creativity, you know, all these are very, very important. So I think uh, uh, my suggestion is that while we are looking into the uh, um, revising, in our curriculum, we have to remember that uh, we have to look at the bigger picture that the students that we produce may not but just be uh, for the uh, media industry per se. And I think this is, has been happening for a long time, but for the uh, general market. Okay? So uh, these uh, skill sets that was uh, identified by the uh, World Economic Forum, I think is, is very relevant for us to uh, put into uh, consideration. Okay? Um, the other thing that uh, I would like to share uh, with this, uh, oh, I lost my slides. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, the, what USM has done, actually, I, I should have uh, discussed this earlier, uh, the coming of the uh, COVID-19, just to share with the audience uh, today, um, Back in January, eh, this is before 
uh, the coming of when before Malaysian government uh, announced officially that we are facing the pandemic uh, problem and we start our MCO in March, actually uh, USM has taken some steps and uh, not because of the pandemic, because the pandemic is not here that yet at that time. But uh, we are already looking at uh, issues pertaining to our teaching and learning. Uh, two bold steps were taken in January. Eh? I remember in January before the pandemic uh, start in Malaysia. Uh, one is work from home. USM actually has already introduced uh, work from home since January. Eh? We are sort of uh, experimenting with a few uh, types of job that can be uh, uh, using work from home concept. So we have already introduced, but we introduced that not because of the needs for physical distancing, eh, but it is because of the financial constraint that we have. Eh, so we would like to explore a few other things. Second, that USM uh, did before uh, the COVID-19 uh, came to Malaysia is that uh, we have been promoting uh, blended learning. Okay, uh, in our teaching and learning activities, uh, including, of course, the online teaching, micro credentials, the digit, digital content, innovative pedagogical practices, digital literacy, massive on, open online courses, MOOC, you know, all have been uh, in the pipeline. Okay? Uh, but interestingly, uh, before the COVID-19, people are looking at this initiative with certain uh, skepticism, uh, we have some reservation, if not uh, outright, uh, what do you call, uh, against those ideas. Okay? But many are not so uh, confident with all this initiative. Okay? But pandemic uh, 19 came, suddenly everybody realized that the two initiatives that we uh, promote eh, the work from home, starting from January 2020, and also the blended learning, uh, intensifying actually uh, the blended learning, uh, uh, what you call, uh, uh, programs in, in USM, are uh, all actually uh, comes into place, uh, becomes a very useful, very necessary uh, for us uh, in facing uh, COVID-19. So I think, uh, there are many other uh, aspects that I think I would like to see uh, happening in the uh, as far as the curriculum is concerned. Uh, I mentioned about strategic communication. I mentioned about the, the new skill sets that we are needed for the uh, students. I mentioned about the speeds for change. Uh, we cannot take too much time for us to, to change. I think even though we may be a bit conservative about things, but I think the 4IR and the, the uh, pandemic has already teach us that uh, uh, time is not on our side. Okay, So I think uh, those are the things that we need to uh, look at as far as uh, curriculum is concerned. But on the bigger uh, uh, issues as far as uh, teaching and learning of communication is concerned, uh, has to be related to uh, research. Okay? And I think uh, Prof May earlier on has mentioned about uh, various uh, opportunities of doing research, uh, but I think uh, we also need to look at the new analytical tools and eh? not just the new area. Eh? There's a lot of opportunities of doing research on uh, COVID related or pandemic related research uh, in communication, but I think it's about time for us to seriously look into our new uh, analytical tools. We are that three-dimensional in, in, in its forms. Eh? Uh, all along, we have a look at the either physical and the digital forms eh, in our research. Eh? We, we always look at the uh, our social behavior, with the physical part of it, and later on with the coming of OIR, we are start looking into our social behavior on digital media, on online. Eh? So a new research area combined physical and digital. But I think the 4IR, uh, and also the pandemic, eh, uh, which has the new dimension, which is uh, uh, the medical, uh, the health uh, dimension, which is very much related to biological. So I think there is a real uh, need for us to relook uh, if there is such uh, analytical tools that we can do a study that will encompasses all these three dimensions of physical, 
digital and the bi biological world. Okay? So I think that those are the th things that, that we have to uh, seriously look into when we are talking about uh, curriculum uh, revisions in our universities as far as communication is concerned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Adnan. Uh, since we have time, I got here one question. Uh, the question comes from Dr. Paridah Ibrahim. I think everybody knows her. <laughs> uh, her question is, we cannot dismiss the challenges due to the pandemic that make it important for virtual learning that may result in the widening of education quality because of the digital divide. What could be our proactive steps? Can I get my comments from the panelists? Uh, can I begin with uh, Professor May? The digital divide and its impact on learning. Thank you. I, I don't know whether Farida is, is there. She, she said that she had to step out, but um, uh, yeah, I, I'll just assume that she'll hear the answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, in, I, I think I mentioned that in March, we required everybody to move the learning um, online and yeah, and, and in fact, you know, the examinations were coming up, our final year project presentations were coming up, and there were a lot of uh, concerns and uh, pushback from the, the students and faculty, right, who were concerned about uh, what happens to the quality of teaching, what happens to teaching feedback, um, what happens to the student experiences, and so on. And I think that um, uh, over the, you know, the, the past months in this semester, and over the summer, there's been quite a lot of um, discussions. At, uh, in NTU, we had a uh, number of sharing and panels where the faculty you know, had a chance to, to talk amongst one another and try to figure out what was the best way forward. I think certainly the, you know, doing everything on the virtual platform, we recognize that that's not going to be the ideal solution, right? That, that uh, it's going to enable um, the uh, bringing of the content uh, materials to students and in, in, some uh, in, in some types of models, the hybrid model and so on, it can bring the educational experience uh, almost to the, the same quality as the online, uh, sorry, in-person experiences that uh, we are typically used to. Uh, however, the, you know, physical learning and the physical spaces, especially in, in areas like uh, where you need um, studio spaces, where you've got um, lab spaces and so on. I mean, those cannot be replaced exactly. You know, so how do we kind of go forward? And I think that, uh, you know, even across the world, I think this is something that uh, researchers are looking at, whether uh, online and virtual learning spaces are contributing to certain facets of learning much more strongly than others and then what that means. Um, so I, at, at this point, I think, um, you know, Farida's points are well taken. Um, and I mean, on our end, we are trying to, uh, to do a combination, right? That means we've got very, very large class classes. So, so for instance, in the lecture theater type of style, um, you know, classes, we think that the virtual platform will be will enable the um, content to be communicated in a, almost an effect as the same way as you would if you were sitting in a big uh, and large uh, lecture theater. But then what happens to uh, tutorials where you've got, you know, different types of conversations? Can that be done when we split the groups and we have hybrid learning and blended learning and, and so on? Uh, we are you know, trying this out. Uh, and also we are enabling it in, in kind of a mix, mix and match way um, with, with the physical space as well. So, you know, so there are some classes which are uh, meeting virtually, but the students then kind of every other week come back to meet face to face and 
uh, and, and meet everyone together. Um, there are some classes which are uh, kind of looking at the material online and then they come to the classroom and then they have a face to face discussion and so on. So I think different models are, are, are all being, uh, you know, tried and tested. And I think we see a lot on even the, the social media space about, you know, faculty and in other universities across the world, what's worked, what's not worked. Um, for, for us, we have found that um, the, so, so I guess Farida's question was, you know, how do we try to uh, mitigate some of the, the drawbacks in terms of the loss of quality of education is that we're holding a lot of sharing sessions. So faculty who have found success or things have worked really well in their, in their um, classrooms, they are sharing with other faculty. So, you know, because there's no textbooks that tell us what's the best way to do it, we're, we're really learning from one another and we're also trying to um, to learn from some of the other universities who are uh, experimenting with um, these, these different modes as well and of course new technology right that's that's that comes up I mean one of the latest things now is the the linkage between uh, what we are doing now which is like virtual but on a laptop but with um, the mobile and able technology as well so the students can can be connected both on the laptop and then the mobile and you know other types of technological platforms forms as well and and where possible kind of keeping in mind um, the budget and and we, we were lucky that we did this before um, the COVID uh, we are trying to to enable the the classroom spaces to be adjusted for that type of learning as well because our traditional classrooms are not built for for that kind of shared learning space so one of the classrooms that we have we call that newsplex mm -hmm. so you can kind of see all the different types of news information that's coming on in the big screen but at the same time you can be be uh, coming up with your own blogs or your own you know interactive spaces within the classroom and then the others can see it too so it's kind of this this interactive uh, learning newsroom of the future space that that we, we were able to to have up and um, you know so 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 much of it is is experimental but we um, like Farida we do realize and we are concerned with the the potential um, loss of the quality of education as we know it right and so so we're trying our best on that front thank you thank you uh, to the to Professor Dadang, I just want to add on another question from Saidul Haq from University of Chittagong, Bangladesh. Uh, he asked, uh, taking your experience from Indonesia, what are your suggestions for students of developing countries who don't have strong internet connection and smartphones? Good. Could you share your experience in, from, from Indonesia, where certain areas do not have strong internet connections and smartphones? Could this be a lesson to other uh, countries? Oh, Professor Dadang, I think you are uh, muted. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think in Indonesia, uh, only sixty or seventy percent are covered by internet uh, access. Uh, so, uh, in my suggest that uh, in Indonesia, so many not only uh, so many uh, media like the radio, local radio, uh, or the local television. I think we can arrange the cooperation with the government, the local government or school uh, institution uh, to make uh, a cooperation with the local uh, radio and, and uh, local television, I think. Uh, or or uh, if we can do the internet, uh, with the internet access, uh, maybe uh, some like the maybe uh, help uh, getting help to the getting help to the uh, like the parliament to parliament or the local government to uh, serve about the uh, the access. But the important thing in Indonesia in our experience in like the 
uh, in the east of Indonesia, uh, when the ministry, uh, when the ministry, uh, he said that uh, it's time to use the the technology, but uh, for the some uh, place of Indonesia, they have no access to the uh, to the to the uh, to the internet. So my suggest if in Bangladesh or I don't know, and maybe the other uh, uh, countries, uh, uh, because they are the local uh, radio and the local television. Uh, that's potential to raise the uh, cooperation. Uh, in Indonesia, uh, before pandemic, the Ministry of Education uh, set the program Merdeka Campus, independent campus where every university is given the freedom to compile a curriculum where 30% can be done with the uh, campuses or the work of work in their respective field. Current learning is prepared in a hybrid way, changing habit in learning at various level of education. So the virtual learning because of certain situation we have to face, but direct relation are still very much needed as a positive interaction experience. If possible, uh, a combination or hybrid uh, of learning should be carried out, carried out to avoid unintended impact due to virtual learning only. Even though uh, with virtual classes, sharing classes are very possible to be made to expand this course and discussion. I think we uh, students especially should be able to play ro a role in both the virtual world and the real world. Yes, Professor, thank you. Oh, thank you. I just got uh, uh, some several questions, but I think I will combine them and ask the panel, and then you can say, you can comment on those questions, and you can give your, your, your overall comment, and then we will uh, close our session. Okay, uh, there are several questions that are common, eh? touching on curriculum review, uh, how do you review the curriculum and to what extent uh, do big data analytics help in virtual learning and and the curriculum planning? So I will ask uh, Dr. Anand Hussein to comment on these two questions and you can wrap up and I'll go to Professor uh, May and I'll go to, again to Professor uh, Dadang and then we close our session. Okay. Uh, Dr. Anand, right, okay. Uh, thank you, Prof. Sai. Uh, I will try and, and uh, address uh, all those questions. Uh, let, let me address also the questions that were raised by Professor uh, Farida uh, about digital divide. I think uh, many countries, uh, including Malaysia uh, and many of the developing countries, are having these uh, problems of digital divide, not because of the pandemic, uh, not because of the 4IR, but you know, it has been with us. Uh, and we have not uh, been able to uh, solve the problems of digital divide. Okay? But the concern of the digital divide uh, as far as the 4IR and also uh, in the age of these uh, uncertainties is because of uh, the problems between the haves and the have not. Okay? We have not been able to resolve uh, the huge disparity between the rich and the poor uh, who have access to uh, afford uh, to have access to the internet. Okay? That's one aspect of it, the economy aspect. The other one is the infrastructure, the national infrastructure. Uh, not all parts of the country is well connected. Eh? That's infrastructure problems, even though uh, for the past many years, the government has tried uh, to uh, introduce or establish what we call uh, Pusa Internet Desa, you know, where uh, people can go and, and use internet at the, in the remote areas, but it's not totally so resolved. So the, the issues of uh, uh, teaching and learning is going to be much worse when we do not have accessibility, when we have blended learning, when we have online, we have virtual, but when students do not have access to uh, all those facilities, eh, and then I think they will be left behind. The, the concern by the UNESCO and also World Health uh, Organizations, uh, for instance, mentioned about there are uh, currently 290 million children, not just higher education, but also uh, the, the children are affected worldwide with the pandemic because of the uh, MCO and because of the closure of the schools in 22 countries. And uh, there are 13 countries which has the school uh, totally shut down. Okay? So this uh, certainly will affect uh, students uh, teaching, uh, uh, students learning process. Okay? 
we may not see the consequence of this, eh, the shutting downs of uh, schools, the changing of the mode of teaching and learning using uh, the, the new technology, uh, where some students, uh, children will be deprived of the learning. The effects will be four or five years down the line. Eh? Once they graduate, we, we can only see the consequence, the impact, the negative impact of, of these uh, deprivations of the accessibility to the internet, uh, uh, not now. Okay? They may feel the problems now, but whether or not uh, our education systems are able to provide still good education under this adverse uh, situation. So I think this is something for us all uh, needs to be concerned about uh, and continue to, to think, uh, uh, looking into the possibilities. Uh, as far as the questions by, I would like also to touch on the questions by uh, uh, Riza and also Coach Hyung. Uh, in terms of uh, media education, uh, I think uh, when we talk about media education, uh, I think you are referring to media education at the school level. Uh, in many universities, they have started introducing media education. Uh, maybe uh, it's not about whether they should or not, but what is the content of the media education should be uh, introduced. Okay? Uh, the answer is yes, we should start introducing media education, but what kind of media education we, we need to uh, introduce to the, to the schools okay, for the students. Okay, as for the data analytics, uh, I think data analytics is more relevant uh, uh, for research. Okay? When we are doing research, uh, rather than doing currently, we are doing survey, we are doing uh, uh, all the various uh, conventional techniques of data gathering. I think what the big data analytics giving us the opportunity to tap on the wealth of data that is available online, that is available on the cyber world. Okay? That's what data analytics is concerned. So I think uh, as far as te teaching and learning is concerned, we have to start teaching students how to tap this wealth of information and data on online for, for our research, for our learning and for our daily activities. Okay? So I think uh, that's how I see the relevancy of data, big data analytics in our uh, teaching and learning as far as uh, communication is concerned. So I think my last words as uh, to wrap up, I think uh, we, we are all living in this state of uncertainties. Eh? Again, I would like to stress the point that uh, one is because of pandemic and the other one is because of the, uh, the 4IR, the coming of the 4IR. And, and I think what the, the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic makes it worse is because Nobody seems to have an answer to this. I think Prof May also rightly uh, point out to this, okay? because we do not have the answer to this uh, issue, new issue. Uh, we are still all struggling, try to learn from each other. There is no ready-made or textbook uh, answers to this. There is no model for us to emulate or to learn from. Okay? Uh, we may learn from uh, Wuhan, China, how to, they deal with that. Uh, to a certain degree, but maybe the situation in Malaysia is different uh, in terms of our uh, social fabrics, so on and so forth. Eh? Uh, and this is the first time actually in our history that we, can, we cannot look to the West to learn something. Eh? It is a disaster. If we, we try to learn from the US, from the Western Europe, look at what happened, uh, how they deal with the pandemic. Eh? So I think this is a time that the Asians, the, 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 the new nations will have to take charge of our problems and issues. Eh? And of course, I think I second uh, uh, Prof May and also Prof Dadang that we have to do more collaborations between our uh, neighboring countries because I think we share a lot of commonalities between us and I think it's easier for us to deal with this answer rather than to look and wait for the ready-made answers coming from the West and especially from the US, so on and so forth. So I think that that's my... Uh, concluding remarks uh, to uh, this conference. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Professor May, would you like to add on to that? Yeah, um, uh, maybe I, I, I just tried to see, um, you know, what areas um, might not have been um, uh, answered previously, yeah, yeah. perhaps perhaps a little bit on the 
um, there's a question from Dr. Hafiz uh, on managing um, the curriculum review. I'll, yes. I'll try to answer that and yeah, and then just kind of conclude on, on that note. Um, so Dr. Hafiz asked about the uh, curriculum review. You know, I, I think that the um, panelists have all shared also the need to, um, to review quickly and to be able to implement some of these changes. This is often at odds with what we have typically done in our universities because if you do curriculum review it can take two years you know from my experience to finish reviewing the curriculum then you have to to put it up and then after the ministry will come back and ask questions and then you back for and you know, the whole experience can years implementation um and uh, that could be a unique singapore experience but you know we have quite Bureaucratic, uh, yeah, government <laughs> systems, and yeah. and it takes a long time. So one of the experiences that I have is to propose that we uh, we do the curriculum review, but we only think about one particular year impact at the time because the group that will be impacted most are the the new students who are going to come in next year so if we're trying to launch next year you know that's the group that will be impacted so what we're trying to do is to say that we have a new curriculum that's going to come into place but can they um, approve different you know almost like step by step so we're trying to split it up into the kind of uh, uh, the primary year components, which is the junior years and then the senior years. And by doing that, we're hoping to cut the amount of time that will be needed. Um, so it's kind of like akan datang, you know, the next stage okay. <laughs> and, and, and to, um, to get the first stage approved. So hopefully that can, can um, shortcut some of the processes because right, it's, I, I think what we're all hearing about the need to, to move fast is often at odds with our very bureaucratic um, uh, committees, uh, you know, in the in the government space. So that's that's one experience I wanted to share. And then um, just the I think that um, just to add a little bit to what um, Prof Anan had said about the utilization of big data. If um, you know, many of our e-learning spaces will be able to help us collect some data as well. So unlike um, teaching in a physical classroom, when we teach, even like this now, when we're having um, this session, right, we, we would be able to see things about how many people have asked questions, um, how engaged people are, whether, you know, we could put a little questionnaire here about how many of, of the participants now are, are doing something else, you know, which will be like multitasking. So we could get some information. And from there, uh, so some of my colleagues have gotten back uh, information about their classes, like um, how, how connected the students were, how often they, they put up their hands and so on. And from there, they were able to tweak a little bit um, to improve their course offerings as well. So that's one thing that, one way that maybe some of the big data analytics can help in the uh, virtual teaching, uh, Kok Xiong's question just now. So, so I guess, yeah, just on the final note, yeah, I, I, you know, probably want to echo what uh, Prof Anan has said and also Prof Dadang that, you know, although we are facing many, many challenges, um, you know, we, you know, I am optimistic that, you know, communication education will continue to play a, a big role in the post-COVID world and that, you know, and that uh, although things will be hard, that I think like as communication scholars, we are all creative and, you know, we, we, we have the right uh, set of resilience and the skills that Prof Adnan showed, all those skills, you know, the, the critical thinking and creativity and so on, uh, to be able to weather this um, all together. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, last member, uh, Dr. Dada. Uh, you like to pick up some of the questions and then round up? Round, round. Yeah, I think I agree with the, uh, what was said uh, from the Prof. Adnan and Prof. May. Uh, for the analytic big data is currently one of the things that get attention, especially on uh, the communication or informatic campus. There are many aspects related to big data analytics. Uh, social, political, economic, and other aspects, including the aspect of uh, personal uh, security. Oh, okay. In this era of uh, uncertainty, I think social sol solidarity needs to be strengthened, including uh, in the implementation of learning that tends to be applied uh, as if everyone has access to it, such as virtual learning. Therefore, I think uh, the campus 
must be very smart and wise to determine various reviews of curriculum changes and learning method, including in the current era of technology and information development. Plus, in a pandemic situation, it's not easy to be it's not easy to change the the, the curriculum. We, we should be careful, careful and uh, and wise. Uh, the last statement: adaptation, collaboration, and empathy are important words that shouldn't be left behind. Including, uh, we can share good uh, experience with its others' wisdom. That's all, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I say, express our appreciation to our three panel members, uh, Professor May. Uh, Professor Anand, so Dadang, uh, you have identified the problems. I think we have identified three main problems uh, pandemic uh, of COVID 19, economic uncertainty, and the changing landscape, eh? uh, besides other items, which we put it under uh, a threat or uncertainty. But despite that, I think three of you have expressed optimism. Um, the, our discipline to communication has a field of study has made us more optimistic. They'll be able to find solutions to all these problems. Uh, and through this being optimistic, we need to find greater collaboration. We need to do more research. We could need to change our, our curriculum and be more responsive and sensitive to all the problems facing us. And we hope that we can build a better future uh, despite all these uh, threats and uncertainties. Eh? And we shall emerge, I think, eventually as winners in despite all these threats. Eh? So with that, I'd like to say thank you again to Professor May, to Professor Anand, to Professor Dadang for your contribution. I hope that you all come again when we organize another uh, international or virtual conference in the years to come. So thank you very much. Our pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very thank much. You very thank, much you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor May. Thank you. Yeah, Good wish you good health. Yeah, yeah. Bye -bye. see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Yeah, Bye. thank you. Thanks, Farida. Oh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Thank you. Back, yeah. OK. Bye-bye. Okay, okay, thank you very much, uh, distinguished panelists and also the moderator and audience for your active participation. We'll now take a short break and come back for session two at 2 p.m. Thank you.